Okay, 2.5 on page 139. Solving radical equations. So remember that I told you that rules for radicals are very, very similar to the rules for polynomials. So let's get started. Remember how to solve equations and inequalities. Equations with an equal sign, inequalities with the other signs. I'll start with the first one. So we got, we need to get, our goal is to get x equals. We need to get all the x's on one side, all the numbers to the other side. So 17x plus 13x plus 32, just write it there. First step, subtract 13x. And then that gives us 4x is equal to the 32 and divide by the 4, which gives us an answer of x is equal to 8. Try to note the next ones. I'll go down to this inequality, and I'm going to let you try the next two yourself. Okay, so start with writing it down, x plus 7 less than 5. Treat it exactly the same way that you would if it was an equal sign. The only extra rule you have to remember is if you multiply or divide by a negative, you've got to flip the sign. I'll just subtract 7. So then x is equal to, or sorry, x is less than negative 2. And there's your answer. I want you to try to pause now, try to do the next two, and then start it up again, see if you got it right. Okay, so looking at this next one, first thing that we want to do with that one, I'll just write it up again for you, minus 5, 4, 4 equals 6. First step you want to do, let's multiply that 4 up and over. Multiply both sides by 4, cancels that part off, you get 3. And it's a good idea to distribute that in, most people like to, you don't have to, there's more than one way of solving this. I'm going to distribute it in because that's what most people end up doing. 3x minus 15 is equal to 24. Add the 15 over. So then 3x is equal to 39. And divide by the 3. So our x is equal to 13. And then the last one there. Three y less than or equal to five y minus nine. We want to move the y's to one side, so I'm going to just subtract five y, which gives us negative two y less than or equal to negative nine. And I'm dividing now by the negative 2. Dividing by the negative 2, that means I flip the sign. So then y is equal to 9 over 2. Or y is greater than or equal to 4.5. So now we've got a little bit of a more real-life situation. And they, they use a lot of these, these types of formulas when they do uh, traffic accidents. And they investigate and they need to know how fast was the vehicle driving or how long the skid marks are. They, they use these types of, of equations. So we've got S is the speed that the vehicle is traveling. D is the skid distance and F is the drag factor. The drag factor is based on what surface we have. If it's cement, asphalt, gravel, ice. So we are going to now say that we're traveling at 
50 miles per hour. And this, this equation is in miles per hour. There would be a different one for kilometers per hour. So the first one, we're going to do the cement. So what you need to do is know that your S for all of them is going to be 50. So for each equation, where you see the S, you're going to put 50. And the equation was S equals square root of 30 d f. So for cement, for cement we know that f is equal to 1.20 from that chart. Plug them in. 50, because s is 50, is equal to the square root of 30 times d. That's what we're looking for. Times f. 1.20. In order to work this one through, we need to get and solve for d. So that means we've got to start doing the opposite of whatever's on the right side. 30 times 1.2, we're going to do that one first, just to clean it up a little bit, and we get 36d. Now in this case, we want to get rid of the square root, so we're going to do the opposite function. The opposite of square rooting is squaring. So we're going to square both sides. And that's going to give us 2500 is equal to 36d. And now we just divide by 36. So then d is equal to a bulk because we're rounding it 69.4. Repeating. So it's about 69. These about 69. And that's the distance in feet. Same exact that we would do if we did the other ones. So if we're doing asphalt, we're going to use F is equal to 0 0.99. And we'd follow exactly the same process. Plugging it in. So then 50 is equal to the square root of 30 d times 0 0.99. Clean it up by multiplying in underneath there. 29.7 d. And then here's the thing that you really have to be learning from this lesson right now. If we're solving and we've got a square root and we're solving for what's underneath the square root, square both sides. And so we get... 50 squared, which is again 2500, is equal to 29.70. And this time we're dividing by 29.7. And that leaves us with the distance on this one of 84.17. Okay, dot, dot, dot. So it's about 84 feet. And then you can do the other two. And I'll leave those for you if you'd like to do them. For the uh, gravel, you should come up with 104. And for the ice, you should come up with 333. Consider this equation. Square root of 5x is equal to 10. We know that the radical is defined when the radicand is greater than or equal to zero, which means that the x value has to be positive in order for this to work. If x is negative, we can't do this question. It's not defined there. So there's a restriction. So we need to isolate x. We need to get x by itself as we solve any of them. And here's our step-by-step -step play. Like I had said, we're squaring both sides. There is one step that I'm going to add into there first, which is we want to get the square root by itself, which already is in this question. But step number one is going to be isolate the radical. Step number two, square both sides. And then step number three, solve for the x. Following through with that.
one thing that you have to do with radicals that you don't have to do with polynomials is you've got to verify. You have to make sure that your answer actually works. So two kind of ways of showing that it actually works. One, and the best way, is to verify it. That means take your answer, your answer was 20, take that answer and plug it in for wherever you see the x. You've got the left side, which is 5x, you've got the right side, which is 10. So on the left side, we've got an x, we plug in and substitute in 20. Substitute in the 20. It's best to substitute with brackets. So we're taking that and substituting it in for the x. And then work it through to solve to make sure that the left side equals the right side. That's one method of verifying. The second method of verifying is using this. It's saying that the x value has to be greater than or equal to 0. Did I get that? The 20, is it greater than or equal to 0? Yes. So it is in the set that it is defined by. If you get, if it said negative 20 there, we would know that it would not be a root that we could use. Because the left side is equal to the right side, the solution is x equals 20. Taking a square root is the inverse of squaring. It's the opposite function. Squaring and square rooting are opposite. These inverse operations are used to solve radical equations. A radical equation is an equation, means it has an equal sign, with at least one radical, whose radicand is a variable. A solution to a radical equation is a root of the equation, if it is a root, then we say that it has a real root. Otherwise, it's not a real root. It's going to be an extraneous root. We'll come to that in a little bit. All right, so solve for each and verify the solution. And again, I do recommend that you try to do some of these yourself. Pause the video, do it yourself, and then see if you got them right. So from here, step number one that I had said, isolate a radical. And you might say, oh, well, I have the uh, radical isolated, and that would be okay. You could do it. Or you could say, hmm. Well, I could divide the 4 over, and that would isolate the radical even more. Either way is going to be fine. But as long as there's no plus and minus happening on the same side that the radical is. So I'm going to go through, and I'm going to divide that 4 over. I'm going to say 3 over 4 is equal to root x. All I did is divide both sides by 4. Now I'm going to square both sides. So step number 2, square both sides. Three squared gives me nine. Four squared gives me sixteen. Squaring and square rooting cancel each other off, leaves me with an x. So my x is equal to. And then step number three is just solve, which in this case we we're lucky it just gave us the answer already. Let's solve for x. So we're just going to say x is equal to nine over sixteen. Before I box it in. I'm going to check to see what were my restrictions right off the bat. So I've got to do my restrictions. X has to be greater than or equal to zero. Is that true? Yes, it is. So it's going to work out. They're asking you to verify. Verify means take the answer, plug it back into the original, and see if left side equals right side. Verify. I have left side, which is 3, right side, which was 4 root x, 
So I've got 4 times the root of 9 over 16. Square root of 9 is 3. Square root of 16 is 4. 4 and 4 will cancel each other off. And I get left with 3. So left side equals right side. Yep, that answer works out. Let's try the second one. So your goal, first step, isolate the radical. I don't have it isolated, so I'm going to start moving it over. I'm going to add 7 to both sides as my first step. So then 13 plus 7, 20 is equal to 2 root x plus 1. I could square both sides, but I'm going to divide by 2 just to get the root all by itself. So then 10 is equal to square root of x plus 1. Square both sides, that's my next step. Ten squared, one hundred. Square and square rooting cancel each other off. X plus one. Step number three: solve for x. Subtract one, subtract one. So then my x is equal to ninety-nine. Before you box it in, we've got to check. Is it a legitimate root? So, I know that x plus 1 has to be greater than or equal to 0. The radicand has to be positive. x has to be greater than or equal to negative 1. Is my answer greater than or equal to negative 1? Yes, it is. So, it's probably going to be working. Let's just do a quick verifying. Verify. Left side was 13. Right side was 2 root x plus 1 minus 7. So this one's 13. Let's plug it in. 2 root 99 plus 1 minus 7. So 2 times the square root of 100. Minus 7, square root of 100 is 10. 2 times 10 minus 7. 20 minus 7, which gives us, oh yay, 13. So we can say left side equals right side. So this one checks out, box it in. So we'll box that one in as well. So then box in after you've verified the answer. Okay, question number two. Solve this equation and verify the solution. Ooh, two radicals now. But we're very lucky if we notice they're like radicals. We're going to be able to combine them together. So we're going to collect like terms. Isolate the radical on one side. So let's collect our like terms. So decide which way you want to go. You can either subtract the 5 root x, or you can subtract the 4 root x. I'm going to subtract the 4 root x, just because I can look at it and say, mm, I want to try to keep it positive if I can. Not that it's going to matter in the end. So I'm going to start there, making that my first move. Then I get 3 equals 1 root x plus 1. Let's subtract the 1 over. So then 2 is equal to the root x. I don't need to keep the 1 in front. And now I've got my radical isolated. Square both sides. So then x is equal to 4. Let's check. Make sure that that falls in the solution set. We've got the square root of x. The radicand is x. So x has to be greater than or equal to 0. Hey, it's looking like it's going to work. But let's verify. They've asked us to verify. So left side. Left side is 4 root x plus 3. Right side 
is 5 root x plus 1. Substitute in your answer. So then 4 root 4 plus 3. 5 root 4 plus 1. This gives me 4 times 2 plus 3. 8 plus 3. 11. Let's make sure that the other side gets us to 11 as well. 5 times 2 plus 1, 10 plus 1, 11. And you might be thinking, well, why are we doing this? They always are working. Not always going to happen. Okay, so, it says right there, not all radical equations have real roots. For example, square root of that, blah, blah, blah. We know that right now, 2x minus 1 has to be greater than 0. Isolating the x, solving for the x, taking it over, x has to be greater than or equal to 1 half. Well, let's work it through. Let's see what we get. First step, isolate the radical. Get the radical by itself. So we subtract it from 5. Squared to both sides. When we square both sides, we get the radicand, 2x minus 1, is equal to 9. Solve for x now. So we added 1, divide by the 2, x is equal to 5. So now it says here that x is equal 5. Is that greater or equal to 1 half? Yeah. So it looks like it should work. If we had something that was less than 1 half, we would know right off the bat that it's wrong. But with radicals, we still have to verify. So we're going to plug it in. Take the left side, substitute your answer that you got in for the x, and work it through. And you notice that you come up with an answer of 8. But it said that the left side has to equal the right side. The right side was 2. That's not 8. They're not the same value. Because of that, the answer is not correct. So x equals 5 is not a root. You might be wondering, well, why? Why did it even give us that? The reason that it gave us that is because if you were taking the square root of things, you would need to put plus and minus. And there would be two parts of an answer, either the positive or the negative. For instance, in this case, square root of 9 could be positive or negative 3 if you were putting the square root in. But it's already there. It's already saying we want the positive value. And so because of that, it's not going to work out. When we did this work here, we squared and we got rid of that. The algebra doesn't know that you were looking for this, the positive one, not the negative answer as well. Right here was the problem. Negative 3 squared was 9. If it was a positive 3 squared, it would also equal 9. So that's what's going through here. Look at that second line. So I was talking about. So right there, we could also say, wait a minute. What value could I put in for x? Then if I worked it through here, I'm going to get a negative number after I square root. Well, there's no way that you can take a square root of a number with a positive sign in front and make it equal to a negative. It's not going to happen. So right off the bat there, you would be able to say, oh, stop. This isn't going to work. It's not going to be an answer. So we could have stopped ourselves early and realized that we didn't even need to get to verify. We call these extraneous roots. 
something else. Show that this has an extraneous root. Well, they're telling you it's extraneous. We just need to prove it for you. Isolate the radical. We have two radicals. Lucky for us, there's no adding and subtracting after them. We've got them both isolated. Isolate one on each side when it's this case. Square both sides. Big X. 2x minus 5 is equal to x minus 7. Solve for the x. So x, I'm also going to add 5 at the same time. So in this case, we've got x is equal to negative 2. If we look at where our restrictions were, on the first one it was 2x minus 5 has to be greater than or equal to 0. 2x has to be greater than or equal to 5. x has to be greater than or equal to 5 over 2. We also have the other one, which is x minus 7 has to be greater than or equal to 7. x has to be greater than or equal to 7. Well, this is 2.5. So my x has to be greater than 2.5, but also has to be greater than 7. Well, if it has to be greater than 7, I don't even need to worry about saying it's greater than 2.5. If something's greater than 7, it's also greater than 2.5. So this is the more restrictive restriction. So that's the one we're going to look at. I look at my answer. Uh, that is not greater than or equal to 7. Negative 2 is less than. So therefore, this is an extraneous root. And you need to somehow indicate for me, I suggest you just cross it off, and then you write down extraneous. Yes, you need to know that word. That is a word you will see often. Extraneous. Okay, so... Just for the, the written problem here, I'm going to let you go through the example number four that they give in the book so you can see the process of using it for uh, the written word problems. And then we'll all do the next one real quick. The formula D equals the square root of 13H can be used to estimate the distance of the horizon, D kilometers, from an observer at a height of H meters above sea level. An observation platform is to be built on a fire tower. The base of the tower is 100 meters above sea level. How high must the observation platform be so an observer's distance from the horizon is 50 kilometers? Okay, I need to figure out the height of the observation platform. So I'll write T to represent the height of the tower. The height of the observer above sea level is the sum of the height of the tower and the height of the base of the tower above sea level. So, h equals t plus 100. I'll use the formula d equals the square root of 13h. h represents height. And since height can't be negative, the equation is defined for all possible values of h. T equals 50, H equals T plus 100. Now, I'll square both sides of the equation to get rid of the radical. Now, I have 2,500 equals 13 times T plus 100. Next, I'll divide both sides by 13, which gives me 2,500 divided by 13 equals T plus 100. When I minus 100 from each side, I get 2,500 divided by 13 minus 100 equals T. So T is approximately 92.3076. The observation platform must be about 92 meters high. Ooh, exciting. Okay, so now we have a very similar question. An observer is in a hot air balloon that is attached to the top of a 200-meter tower whose base is at sea level. 
Okay, we better start drawing this. Okay. So we've got here, tower is 200 meters, and then a hot air balloon is attached to the top. Here's the balloon. How high above the tower must the balloon be so the observer's distance to the horizon is 100 kilometers? Okay, so we're going to use, well, let's just use x. You can, you can pick whatever you want for that variable. It really doesn't matter. And then we've got, there we go. That's what we're looking at. The formula that we were just introduced to was d is equal to root 13h. Well, we want to know what is this x value in here. So let's start bringing it in. Our height right there is x plus the 200. The distance that we want is equal to 100 kilometers. So then we just plug it in. 100 is equal to the square root of 13 times x plus 200. And then we solve. Isolate the radical. It's already there. Square both sides. So then we've got 10,000 is equal to 13x plus 200. If you want, you can distribute the 13 in. That's an option, and that's what I've done in the other ones. I'm going to do it a different way to show you that you can do it a different way. I'm going to divide the 13 over right now. Both of them are perfectly fine, whichever method you like. So then... 10,000 over 13 is equal to x plus 200. Subtract 200 over. So x is equal to 10,000 divided by 13 minus 200. Punch that into your calculator. And x is equal to 569.2307. Written question, written answer. A balloon must be about 569 meters above the tower.